God. So before I start my message, I want to make a couple of statements about what's going on in Israel. Amen. A lot of stuff on YouTube. People trying to find a prophetic um, significance of what's happening, you know. Um, and there might be, but it's still very vague of what it could be. Some say it's Ezekiel 38 and 39, but we heard that when uh, Russia came in uh, to the Ukraine and, and so forth. But what is happening? I think that it is prophetic, but what, which prophecy is it? I don't know, but I do know like different things like the scripture. First scripture came to my head was that when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes on those, you know. So Israel was like totally 100% caught off guard. Why did that happen? But what I'm hearing right now is that China and Iran and uh, Russia is the one that, that did a cyber attack right before it went down. You know, but let me tell you the big picture. I, I said this to the guys at the men's breakfast yesterday in um, First Peter 5 and 8. It, it says that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, and as far as the world's concerned, he's already got them. So he's seeking Christians. He's seeking things like this. If you look at this big picture, what you're seeing is actually that scripture unfolding. They, they saw the opportunity, they staged it, it was set up, and then on that day it attacked. And that's how Satan works. So when we, when we think, you know, hey, everything's good, everything's fine, man, just be on your guard. Because he's been waiting on you to get lax and get lazy in your Christian walk, you know. So is this prophetic? Yeah, I see in times we're in. I mean, a lot of stuff that goes on divides the world up, and, but... But Israel, nothing divides this world like Israel does. You know, right now it's, it's divided. Palestinian and so forth. And uh, we need to pray for all those, those soldiers in Hamas. We need to pray for the Palestinians. We definitely need to pray for Israel, of course. We need to take a stance as a Christian to not, to not hate. And to not say things like, man, I just hope he just wipes these people out. Never forget that if, when the, everyone that gets killed in Hamas is going to go to hell, there's no doubt. Because they don't believe in Jesus. They got hate in their heart and murder and so forth. So, you know, we need to stay in, in where we need to be. And that center road is Christian. We need to have a Christian mentality. Christian way of thinking. We need to be praying for all involved. That's both sides. We, we are not those who take sides in the world. You know, I remember watching the movie Jesus of Nazareth. And Barabbas was trying to get Jesus on his side to, to kick the Romans out. You know, and he told him, he said, he said, Barabbas, you know, you need to, you need to have love in your heart. You need to love your enemy, you know. And, uh, and that's where we are. We, you know, we got wickedness out there. We got people out there stealing, ripping off. We have to remain in a straight and narrow. We have to pray for those. We need to, we need to love our enemy. We need to pray for them. Everybody on the page that I'm talking about, this is what Christians do. We're not in the world to take sides. We vote, we pray, we seek God, and we vote for who God tells us to vote for. And, and we don't take sides. We pray for both sides. We're always praying for people and souls. I understand? You know, I'm hearing a lot of terrible stuff. I see on, on YouTube there's a lot of terrible things that so-called Christians are, are saying about this situation. You know, let's not play God. God didn't leave us here to play God to decide that we should say Hamas needs to be totally wiped out and killed. That's what they do and that's God's will and that's what he does. But it isn't our place to be God and judge people to go to hell. Anybody agree with that? Yes. You know, I mean, we're here. We are the light and the salt of the earth. You know, we are determining, you know, salvation, not, not judgment. Let, let God handle that. That's why in that Lord's Prayer when he said, teach us to pray. And in one part it said, your will be done. Believe me, God's will is going to be done. God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You know, there's a law to harvest. He's going to handle this. Our job is to pray. Because if they die and they don't know Jesus, they're going to hell. And that's all I got to say about it. Let's be Christians. Let's pray. That's what Christians do. Continue without season. Do you, how many of y'all breathe? Y'all breathe? How many of y'all breathe? 
Some of y'all's not breathing. At least you don't. You say you're not. If you breathe, you can pray. Praying should be no different than breathing. We should be praying continuously, the scriptures say. Amen? Amen. All right. I got a message this morning for everybody. It's for anybody, but it's but not everybody can is going to identify with this message. So, but I'm hoping because it's for everybody. Okay? To walk in freedom. Everybody say freedom. freedom. Okay. By being a willful slave. Everybody say slave. slave. <clears throat> That's like an oxymoron. Freedom and slavery. How is how can these two be put together? But if you want to truly walk in freedom, you need to learn how to be a slave. So you're going you're gonna to find out what I'm talking about in just a second because y'all looking at me weird. I heard one amen. <laughs> Here in Luke chapter 9, then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So this is, this is the thinking of the gospel. When you, when you want to react, you don't react type of thing. If you want to live, you die. Take up the cross. Okay? If you, want, if you want to walk in his blessings, you need to deny yourself. You know, when that rich guy came to Jesus and he had kept all, everything that Jesus told him to keep, he said, but you lack one thing. Sell everything you got and follow me. You shall have riches in heaven. And he walked away. He couldn't do it. But the thinking wasn't that God was particularly saying that to everybody. But to that young man who had his riches first, he never understood the, the blessings he would have had by, by giving it to the poor and following Jesus. You know, so this message I'm about to, to teach you is in the scriptures, but not everybody can hear it. You know, the scripture says, let anyone who has an ear hear what the Spirit's saying. There's some hard things in scriptures that are hard to understand. You know, it's, and it's not so much that it's hard to understand to the place that R can read it and see what it says, but it's hard to understand because it's hard to, um, to a person to get into that mode, that, that thinking. Just like what I said about how we should be praying for the enemy as well as Israel, you know. I mean, because we're not in this world. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, so who are we to go and condemn the world? You know, the things that they do out there that are wicked, they're not saved. Okay, that's, that's the answer to it all. The reason they're doing what they're doing is because they're not saved. And they need to know Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Oh, so what is this? That's my glasses. Who needs glasses? There we go. Now it won't be making so much noise. All right. And now in Deuteronomy... In, is a, there's a couple of scriptures in Deuteronomy and there's another passage also. And, um, but this is where I'm going with this message. But suppose a male slave says to you, I don't want to leave because he loves you and your family and is happy with you. Then take an oil, you know what that is? Puncture a hole, you know? And pierce it through his earlobe into a door and he will be your slave for life. Do the same to a female slave if she doesn't want to leave. So back in that day, they had slaves. And these slaves were usually either taken in war, <clears throat> but somebody could owe you money and they, and they could not pay the debt. So they would become your slave and then they would work off that debt. And then on the day of, um, which was the Jubilee, and there was another time too, they had to release these slaves. Okay, it's a year of Jubilee, every 50 years. And so they, they had to release them. And not only just release them, they had to bless them. They had to give them some cattle and so forth and bless them and send them on their way. But if that master was so great and so loving and so caring and brought them in to their own home and so forth, they might not want to leave, which was okay. But that decision they were making would have involved the ear piercing. And uh, that would be a symbol and it would signify that they were an eternal or the whole time they would be alive slave to that master and they would stay under that master Jesus is our master he's our Lord our Savior our King you know he has he has set us free from sin 
He has washed us clean. And you've got to make these decisions inside of you. What, what I'm talking about, everybody could say, I want to be, you know, Jesus' servant, his slave. I want to be eternally his. But yet what Christ does is that he gives us all liberty. That's why I use the word freedom. Because say what the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. And we all have been given freedom. Now, what, it's, what he's saying is that, just like when he told, he came and he healed these people and he said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So he, he's, he healed them and then he walked away and gave them a choice. You know, Lord's not going to make you serve him. Lord's not going to force you to serve him. You've got to make up your mind about that. And we're in an age and time frame now where there's just so much in our face. So much to distract us. So much taking place. And it's all of those things that we're really being tried and tested with. And, um, you know, to see if you really love the Lord or not. But this is uh, something that they did back in that, in that Old Testament times that was a symbol. When you saw somebody working for someone and they had a hole in their ear... You knew, you knew that they were now a perpetual slave to that master because that master was awesome. We serve an awesome master. But I want to show you something that Jesus showed us himself in Philippians 2. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. I let that sink in. Do you have the same attitude that he had? You know, I mean, it's so many awesome things that he did. I mean, as far as when, like, when he's standing before Pilate and, st and standing before the Sanhedrin and the high priest and all, he didn't utter, he didn't utter a word he, until he finally said, you say that I am type of thing and uh, came to bear witness of the truth. But he didn't utter a word. Even Pilate got upset. Don't you see I have the power to set you free or to condemn you? And then he responded, you don't have any power unless it's been given to you by my father. You know, so, but this, Jesus had this certain attitude. He's called the way because we're supposed to follow him and, and walk in his footsteps. But Jesus Christ did this, now watch this. Though he was God, right? He is God. But though he was God, he did not think of equality with God. It's something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Amen? So right here we see that he's God. I mean, he could, he didn't have to do what he did and so forth. But when he came to earth, he took on the form of a slave. He literally yielded himself to his father. Now why did he do this? Well, it needed to be done, of course. But why did he do this as far as we're concerned? Well, he needed to be like Adam, and he needed to be able to die for our sins. But that was, Adam didn't have to, he was born basically, you know, a servant of God in perfection without any sin. So, but why did he have to give up his glory and be a slave? It's because he's showing us something. Okay? You know, and when you look at the life of Jesus, you see him being just all-powerful, right? I mean, he's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And he healed blind eyes, and he cleansed lepers, and he forgave people of their sins. And on and on I can go. He came and showed us the love of the Father. But he did all of this because he was in complete submission to the Father. Because he was not doing anything on his own. He said, I only do the things that I'm told to do. I only do what the Father's telling me to do. So every leper he cleanses because the Father said, cleanse him. With every blind eye. <laughs> I was looking over at Justin. Of every blind eye, brother. <laughs> hey, man, he's getting ready to put some drops in you. For every blind eye, the Father said, Touch their eyes. But every demon possessed person, the father said, cast the devil out of that guy. Amen? Amen. He was on the road in Nain, and, uh, and there was a funeral 
And he stops, and the father says, go raise her son. That's the only son she's got. So he stops the whole funeral and raises this lady's son. But everything he's doing, he's, he's, he's listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's why they was to put their ear on the doorpost of the person's house. And it was pierced. So that they would only for the rest of their life hear the voice of their master. I love this master. That, don't, that doesn't mean that the slave was going to just be lazy. I like it because, see, they feed me and everything's good here. And you know what? When I look at Christianity and I see Christians today, they got that kind of attitude, man. They don't have to do anything. I'm saved now. My name's in the book. I'm going to heaven. And then the devil came up with a, with a doctrine, once saved, always saved. So now you can just go out and do anything you want, and you're still going to heaven, <clears throat> which is a lie from the pits of hell. But Jesus was listening to the voice. That slave was to listen to the voice of his master. The master said, go and do this and do that. He was to do it. You know? So everything he did was the father doing it. He didn't do anything. If he, if he passed up somebody who was sick and didn't heal him, it's because the father said, don't heal him. But when the father said, heal him, he stopped and healed him. Amen? And so, even when they were screaming out, the blind men screaming out, you know, Jesus, son of David, he wouldn't even have stopped. Until the father said, stop. And heal these two men. And one, one gospel says one guy, the other one says two. But anyway, he stopped and he healed them. And on and on, as he's walking in journey, Zacchaeus is up in the tree, and the father says, you need to go eat at his house today. Zacchaeus, I need to eat at your house today. Because <laughs> the father's talking to him. See, they don't see that. All they saw is this man, Jesus. And here's, and here's the, this, it's a good thing, but it's also a sad thing when we only see Jesus. All right? I mean, he's my savior. He died on the cross. I worship him. When I give honor to him, I'm giving honor to the father. But I understand that the big plan is all coming from the father. Amen. And he's speaking. And Jesus is speaking through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. He said he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now right here you see, you know, he's, he was obeying God. And he died on a cross. Because the Lord, Father, he said, if possible, could this cup pass. But not my will, whose will? The Father's will be done. And he died a criminal's death. You know, you're falsely accused. You have people out there that know you're a Christian. And, they, and they're out sitting around with their friends judging you. You ever been judged by anybody, huh, Brad? I'm saying that because I know Brad's been judged. But we've all been judged. We all have failed. And people have seen our failures. And we've said things that we, we probably shouldn't have said. And maybe we had to say we're sorry. Yeah, some Christian you are, they say, you know. And you're being judged kind of being falsely accused because, see, we're, we're being judged as if we're not saved, as if we're criminals. But we've been made washed in the blood of Jesus. We've been what made white. We are now citizens of heaven. We're children of God. But here's the deal. How can we keep ourselves from getting caught up in this world? I'm hearing Christians, you know, attacking the, um, the Hamas and saying things, you know. And what they're saying is pretty much truth. You know, they need, they need to be dealt with. But we are Christians. See, it's not our place to deal with Hamas. It's not our place to deal with the drug addicts and all on the street. You know what our place is? Is to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and do what He tells us to do. But here's the problem. If we don't yield our lives and get a hole in our ear type of thing, you're not going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And every decision you're going to make is going to be within your own subconscious and your own brain. Every conversation you get in, everybody you come and talk to, it's going to be what you think you should say. Amen? Amen. There's some people that you will be told to talk to and you won't hear the voice of the Spirit to talk to them. But then there'll be somebody saying, don't get involved in that group. And yet you'll be right there and get involved in that group. You're not listening. You're not hearing. 
Because, see, there's a truth in what that scripture says. And it's, that's, it's only like, I think, in two places about when that slave loves his master. And the Bible is just set up for us to, to know the truth that's in it because of the Holy Spirit. And then you go over in Revelation on churches that he who has ears hear. You know, we need to be sensitive. We need to first get, we need to get that gospel in us. Of what Jesus, how did Jesus live, what did he do? And understand why he was doing what he was doing. The gospel of John is more uh, direct at him saying that. Like John 14, he said, you know, about the father. And Philip said, show us the father. And he says, Philip, I've been with you all this time. All you've ever seen me do is the father. I haven't done one thing on my own. I've only done everything the Father's been telling me to do. And we have to get to a place where us as Christians are listening to the voice of the Spirit and only doing what the Spirit's telling us to do. We need to be careful about what we say. Our tongue needs to be totally led by our heart and our heart needs to be transformed by the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. You need to get, you need to get all, like the Bible says in Ephesians, all filthy communication out of your heart. You need to get it out. You need to quit judging people. We need to quit, you know, saying this one deserves to go to hell and this one over here needs to be. Let me tell you about Israel. If Israel don't receive their Messiah, they're going to go to hell too when they die. You know, they're not any more special just because they're God's chosen people. If they don't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they die in their sins, they're going to hell. There's no exceptions. There's no other way. It's Jesus and it's faith in his name only. Cut and dry. If they're over there in India worshiping rats and they don't hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit is speaking to them in dreams and visions. The Lord has sent an angels to preach to the heirs of salvation. That's human beings. They're being talked to while they're sleeping at night. So everybody, I don't care if it's in the darkest jungles of Africa or, or the Amazon, they're being spoken to by God. And they have to accept those dreams and those visions that God is dealing with them on. Therefore God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Right there it's telling us that if we become a perpetual slave servant to Christ and we have a, a hole in our ear or able to hear then understand this, God's going to make you the head, not the tail. God is going to raise you up in conversations with people. You'll have the wisdom you need to talk to people. You'll be able to, to tell them about Christ in such a way, by the life you're living, to make them curious about you. You see, you'll be exalted like he's exalted to an elevated position. Seated at the right hand of God, he'll place you at his right hand. You will be his weapons of war. You will be his voice in this dark world. You see? But if you're on your own, and you're trying to handle this and say things on your own, not being led by the Spirit, you're going to cause more harm than good. Because you don't have what you don't have inside of you what you need to tell them. Amen. You know, I went into a store one time on a trip to Lafayette, and I stopped at Labdell, and I was in there, and maybe I said this one already, and the lady was all down by the cash, but then I went up, and I was just going to buy, I was getting a drink, and then I was leaving, you know, but I was in line, and I was praying, and, and I, I just couldn't stop looking at how sad she looked, and I, I just couldn't, I was about third in line, when I got up to her, I said, um, I forgot exactly what I told her, and it was Christmas time and all, and I said, I said, um, the Lord loves you, and I said, he sees how down you are. She said, yeah, this is not a good time for me as a death in her family. And I said, I said, I want to just pray for you. And I began to just talk to her about Jesus. And when I left, she was smiling. You know, just the right words at the right time can turn away wrath, can turn away sadness, can turn away anything. The right words spoken in the right attitude can make what a difference. We need to, we need to be crying out to God that we hear his voice because there are people in your lives in my life that need Jesus and we we can have the right words we don't have them we have our own words but there's the right word to say 
Amen? So he will elevate you in that conversation. He will elevate you in every circumstance. He will elevate you into the mind of Christ to be able to think the way we need to think. To think like Jesus thinks. We are his body. We are his hands. We are his feet. And he wants to move us where, where we need to be moved. And go to where we need to go. Sometimes we go to places we don't even know why we're there. Why I stopped here? The next thing you know, you're in a conversation. Oh, that's the reason. Amen. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, this scripture is prophetic of future. When everybody comes up before Christ, we will easily bow our knee, won't you? Amen. Oh man, I'll be at that throne, throne of Jesus Christ, knowing I'm going to heaven, but I'll be on my knees, and that's the first words I'm going to say. I, you are Lord. Amen. Because that's what it says. But you know, but what is this for us today? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Okay. Now get this. Those people out there are not controlled by the spirit that you're controlled by. You're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. So there's another spirit that's speaking to their minds. Okay? I mean, this attack from hell that came out of the Gaza Strip was not a bunch of people who belonged to Hamas, like 30,000 of them. It was not Hamas. For we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. They did what they did because the devils control their thinking. Iran don't control their thinking. They just fund everything. And who's controlling them? To fund terrorists, to kill Israel. Why does everybody want to kill Israel? You know, they got like 9 million people in the country. You know, they the size, their country is about as big as New Jersey. You know, what do they want? What's the deal with them? It's because they're God's chosen people. And there's a target on you and on me. Because we're Christians, we're God's chosen people. And the enemy wants to kill you. But what he wants to kill isn't so much your physical life, which he would do if he can. If he, can. he wants to kill your words. He wants to kill what you stand for. He wants to kill, you know, you make a stand for Christ. Oh, he wants to make you look ridiculous. He wants to tear you down. He wants people to mock you and laugh at you. Because why? Well, if you had an ear to hear, you would say the right things. You would do the right things. Things that you hear other Christians do, it would offend you. You know, it would make you say, hey. And you would talk to that other brother or sister in the Lord. You know, they need to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. He'll tell you what you need to be purged of in your life. You know, I'm telling God, man, keep purging me until the day I go home be with you. Just keep, I mean, I, I want to win more souls. And I'm not winning them many directly, but I'm learning, I'm still learning the depth of prayer and praying for souls and interceding for souls. Somebody else might win them, but I took part. Amen? You know, so... The same, that name will cause these demons to bow their knee before you. When you go up to somebody and the Lord's leading you too, those demons that are there, they're not going to bow to you. But if you go in there and you, and you be saying it under your breath, you don't have to just look at the person and say it. But before you even open your mouth, you say, in Jesus' name, I command you to bow your knee. And those devils that are speaking to these people will have to bow their knees. They'll have to shut their mouths so that you can tell them what the Holy Spirit's telling you to tell them. You have authority. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess in heaven or in earth or down in the earth. The devils have to bow their knee to you. And so the devil wants to tell you that, who do you think you are? You think you're Jesus? And I say, no, but I'm part of his body. Amen? You know part of the body I want to be? I want to be part of the liver. Hey, that's part of the body, right? That's something people don't think about a whole lot because they thought about they'd eat right, you know? But the liver is like the most, one of the most important parts of the body. It is the intercession organ of the body. Everything it does, it's touching the body, the cells, the pancreas, everything. The liver is the thing that's, that's touching everything. And that's, that's the part I would like to be part of. I mean, I, I want to be. I don't know what. I don't know. I'm just part of the body. Amen. That much I do know. Amen. 
Verse 11, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's interesting because the devils don't want to confess he's Lord, but you can force them to say it. In other words, they're telling people in the spirit evil things, okay? They're speaking to demon-possessed people. They're speaking to people out there. They might not be demon-possessed, but they're definitely in minds hearing. They don't realize they're hearing from devils. But you can actually, in prayer, tell that devil to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they don't want to. You want to know why? Because the person that they've been putting into their heads is saying he's not Lord. They're saying that, you know, he's not God. He didn't exist, and so forth. But you force him speaking to some loved one, and you say, I command you to say Jesus Christ is Lord. He ha they have to. And when they do, the person they've been, they've been infecting their mind with will hear that inside of their mind, inside of their subconscious. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, a person's being controlled by a devil, and he's doing terrible things, and called you all kind of mean names. Instead of you getting upset, you just start praying for them. And when you do, you tell that devil, you say, in Jesus' name, I command you to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And they will, they will cringe. They will try hard to not to, because they know that they've got a connection to this person's head down in their subconscious. They've been hearing the lies. All of a sudden, they're going to hear, when they say it, that loved one's going to hear, Jesus Christ is Lord. You got that? I'm giving you something new to go in prayer about. But there it says, every tongue will confess. That's every demon, every devil. And all the people, when they stand before Christ, they're going to confess it. You probably won't make them physically say it unless the thoughts in their head changes to Jesus Christ as Lord. To the glory of God. Amen? John 5 says this, Jesus, uh, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So what he's saying? Is he telling us not to judge? Of course not. But what he is telling us to do is make sure that your judgment is righteous. What does that mean? Jesus said, only judge righteous judgment. It means judge the sin and not the sinner. And when you judge, don't judge the person, judge the devil who's been judged. He's already condemned. He's gone to the lake of fire and every demon's gone there. They can't repent. They're not going to get right. So they've already been judged. So you judge them. You see what that person's doing, right? The person's, I don't know, cursing and all that kind of stuff and telling you trash. Well, where's that coming from? It's being, they're being affected by thoughts in their head. They're not hearing any righteous thoughts. Okay? So you, in prayer, while you're interceding, can judge the demons that are speaking to their loved one. And because you observe what the person's doing, then you see what the demon is doing and in speaking into their heads. You understand what I'm saying? And so you judge them. And in any way the Holy Spirit leads you to do so. Because it's righteous judgment. All right, they got, they've been, they've been um, doing drugs or whatever, cursing you out. Just say they're cursing you out. You say, the Lord curses you. And may your curses come back upon your own head. You hear it out of their mouth, that person. So you're speaking it for that to go back onto them. So you're cursing the devils. What does that mean? That means that they start losing their grip on the person. Amen? You need, we need to break that stronghold that's inside of their minds. But we need to have an ear to hear. So we need to, we need to, do, we can't go to a doorpost because Jesus is the door. So we go to him and then he doesn't poke a hole in our earlobe. He opens our ear to hear. Okay? But you got to want that. I was thinking, and this, was, this was actually in the middle of the night. I, was, I went to sleep thinking about my, the message, and, and, it was, and if I preached everything that I got in my head when I was sleeping, we'll be here till tomorrow. But 
It was one thing that he began to wake me up, put you in that half sleep so you can hear it. Anybody ever heard of the keto diet? Yeah. All right. Believe it or not, man didn't come up with it. Your body automatically, when you get off of carbs or burn off all the carbs in your body, automatically goes into ketosis, okay? It's just an automatic thing. So it begins to burn fat. And that's all it is. Man's come up with a way in which to harness that through the diet or thing they call keto. And so when you get lowered in a certain amount of carbs, your body kicks in, ketosis kicks in, and you start burning fat. I mean, that's just natural. It's just the way God created things. So I had that thought because the Lord spoke to me and he just said, he said, man didn't invent keto. I invented keto. <laughs> He said, I put it into the body to be able to do that. That's why your, your body stores and you get fat and it's storing this stuff for energy. We're not burning enough energy nowadays to reduce all of that. So if you automatically on these diets do that and cut the carbs down, you force the body into ketosis. You force it to start eating up the fat and using it up. And he told me, he said, you know, spiritually... When you hear me and you're obeying me and you're walking in me and you feel my presence, anybody ever felt that? And you just get overwhelmed. You're in, you're in spiritual ketosis. But then the moment you sin, you kick yourself out of it. And then, you, and then you, now you need to burn off the sin. How do we do that? You get, you, now you're grieving. Now you're, now you're feeling guilty and you're repenting. And it always seems like I don't immediately get back into God's you know, presence like that. It just seems to be some days. It's like, man, I don't want to sin no more because I hate this feeling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You just feel so bad. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? You know? And so we repent. He washes us clean. But it still takes a little time to burn that off out of your spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins to, begins to expand because he's been grieved. He begins to expand again. And you get back into spiritual ketosis. It's just a natural process. Okay? So he told me that in about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. So I thought I'd share that with you. See, we got to get to the place like Jesus. I can do nothing without him. You can't. I mean, you can go to John 15 and he said, you know, we are the, uh, he's the vine, we're the branches. And you can't do anything without me. The branch cannot do anything without being connected to the vine. And every branch that bears fruit, he's going to prune it so it can bear more fruit. He wants you to bear abundant fruit. But who's it for? For you. Well, what is the fruit? The fruit is just what we go out, we minister. I'm bearing fruit right now, just telling you the truth of God's word, what he's given me. I'm bearing fruit. God wants me to have more knowledge and bear more fruit And when I teach. You know, and at Teen Challenge here, wherever I teach. And he wants you to have more fruit for your loved ones, your children, and everybody else that needs Jesus in your life. He wants you to be having abundance. So he's going to put you through things. Pruning's not fun. So you can bear more fruit. Have more knowledge. Have more understanding. Have more love. More compassion. You know, that's what the fruit is for you. It's for you. you are first partaker of what fruit. It comes with, many Christians don't have any fruit. It's sad. You can just see the frustration and they're depressed all the time and beat down. Where's the fruit? You're supposed to be eating. That's for you first. He who has a vineyard is first partaker of that vineyard. This fruit is first for you. And then you have an abundance so that you eat the fruit and then you give the rest away. That's what we're supposed to have. Abundant life. You know? You don't need anything on this life. You need Jesus. Amen? Now, how to be a slave and walk in his freedom? Anybody want to know? How many of y'all want to know? Okay, the rest of y'all can leave. <laughs> All right, let's look what Paul said. Galatians 2. First off, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Semicolon. And what is he saying? He's saying, that's where you get your ears pierced at the cross. You think those nails in his hands and feet to hold him there was for him? So that's what some Christians think. They might not say that, because you ask them. You may say, no, he died for me. Well, then why are you living for self? Why are you living selfishly? Because you believe he died for his own sins. No, I don't. I don't believe that. Then if you really believe he died for you, then you'll be living for him. 
but you're living for self. You see what I'm saying? No, I'm not living for myself. Oh yeah? When's the last time you prayed for you went to the grocery store? When's the last time you asked, you know, you asked God to, to remind you as you passed Shelmet High to pray for the kids? When's the last time you, we did all of that? I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know how you pray and what God, how God talking to you. But we need to have an ear to hear. We need to, we need to understand that that was, that was me on the cross and I'm still on it. But he came and took me down and he got nailed on it. He's given me life. I was heading for eternal damnation, for hell. But now I'm heading for heaven. Not because of any works I've done, but because what he done, right? What he has done, what he done, <laughs> what he has done. And so, it's the cross where we get pierced. You know, he's been, he was pierced with a spear. We, we've been pierced in our heart from his death. So we need to listen. How many of y'all love him? How many of y'all want to serve him? And that means you need to listen. How can you serve him if you don't know what you're supposed to do? You know, you, you're dealing with your children and you're saying this and that. You're upset, angry because they did this or they did that. We're not listening. You know, we need to be listening so we can raise those kids right. Grandkids. You know, be a light and a witness to the people that we know. And the life which I now live is in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Alright? So he was crucified, but now he's alive. See, I was dead in sins and trespasses. I was heading for hell. I didn't know. But then I got saved, and it was like, I was heading for hell. I was a Catholic, didn't even know it. Because I was Christian, I was going to heaven. That's what I thought. That's what most Catholics think. But they don't, even when you talk to them, though, you're going to heaven, you're like, nobody can know that. But yet, they went through all the rituals. They should have known in their religion that now they were going to go to heaven or purgatory, which would eventually got them to heaven, which there is no such thing. So anyway, the idea is that I didn't know I was sinning. I didn't know I was going to hell. I thought maybe I had enough good works. <laughs> no, you don't. Nobody has good works that many anyway to overcome all the bad works. And so then, then I got saved and realized that would have been my destiny, death on the cross in hell if he wouldn't have died for me. So I began a journey to want to yield to him and, and for him to use me. And then he tells me while I'm only, not even a year old in the Lord, he says, I'm grooming you to be a pastor. And I was like, I didn't hear you right. I went back reading and he said, yeah, I'm telling you that. So that's when I left and went over and talked to the assistant at the church. Brother T, how do you know if, you're going, if you've been called? He said, you've been called. Why? Because you wouldn't be here talking to me. Oh, it's true, huh? <laughs> Man, I just thought God was, you know, you lost it, God, want me to be a pastor. No, he said, I know exactly why you were, you were born. I got many pastors that are not pastoring, and they're heading to hell. I got many people that are evangelists. I got many people that should be hearing, healing the sick. I got many people that should be serving me in music, and yet they're doing their own thing. They're taking all my gifts, I put in them at birth, and they're doing their own thing. And they're going to answer for it. And they're going to be judged and everything's going to be taken away and it's going to be given to my people who have obeyed and listened and listened. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You know, that's, that was the law he was talking about to the Galatian church about the law which was given to Israel. But the law that I see when I read that is, is my own laws that I make up. You make up laws too. You ever, you ever um, did something wrong and you repent and so now you're just looking to do some good things to make up for it? That's just us. That's just our nature. We're just guilty and so now we're trying to, okay, now I'm going to go do like ten good things and God's going to be happy. And he's like, No. I'm only happy the fact you repented and now I've taken away and I've nailed it to the cross and you're forgiven. Now if you really want to make me happy, quit trying to do good works to make me happy and just do good works. That's what Christians do. Christians do good works because we're Christians. You know, a good tree bears good fruit. Bad tree bears bad fruit. So we automatically bear good fruit. When you repent, that's a good fruit. 
It, gets, that, that doesn't wait a week later. It gets everything back in motion. But on the inside, that's the spirit's been grieved and he's got to spread back out again. And you go through that little period of time where you start you to feel that guilt. But just get busy doing good things. Don't try to earn your forgiveness. Just receive your forgiveness. Have that ear to hear. Okay. Anyway. So the idea, we're going to do communion in just a second. But I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. And I need you, you know, I mean, what me, I need you. God wants you to just be honest. Just be honest to God. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you been hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit lately? Now, if you say it on the inside, just being honest, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know if he's been speaking. Then maybe it's time for you. You ever, you ever notice that when somebody gets pierced ears and if they don't continue to keep it open, you know what happens to it? It, it closes up. It might be a scar there, but it closes up. It might, it might be time to make that journey back to the cross. To be reminded. Peter said it like this. Those people that are out there doing the sinful things have forgotten how they got saved. Forgotten about what it took for salvation. The death of Jesus Christ. And they have forgotten about it. Man, we don't want to ever forget what he went through to pay for our liberty. Amen? That's why we're taking communion today. We're going to remember his death and his resurrection. But just be honest with yourself right now. And just, just answer that question. Have you heard the voice of the Holy Spirit lately to do what He's telling you to do? I've asked myself this periodically and I always say, I don't even remember. I don't even know. I guess I wasn't paying much attention. I guess I drifted off and just doing my thing, just deciding my own places to go. And I'm honest. You've got to be honest with yourself. Don't try to make excuses for it. It's just cut and dry, yes or no. And He knows already. He's been speaking to you. He's been talking to you inside. Listen. Be still and know I'm God. Listen to that voice. That still small voice down deep. He's quieter than all the noise around you. If you need to, just tell the devils that's been speaking to you because they're trying to distract you. Just, be, just before you try to listen to say, Devils, I command you shut up in Jesus' name. And they have to. And they have to be quiet. And you'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you'll know what to do. This world will stress you out. How many of y'all know that's true? It'll stress you out. You know, you love your children. They go through things and then you get burdened down with it. And you, you love your friends and they go through things and it burdens you down. It burdens me down when I, when I hear what you're going through. You know? I mean, I didn't, I didn't ask to be a shepherd, but he made me one. And when he did that, he put a heart in me. And I do love you all very much. And I know what you're going through. And I go into prayer and Julie and I, we pray. We lift you all up. Lift you all up every day. And I know what you're going through in many cases. And we lift up what you've told me. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, you think you're all alone. You're not. You're part of the body of Christ. And, and the body of Christ is praying. Sometimes you're praying and you don't even know what you're praying for. You're just praying for somebody in this church or somebody in the body of Christ. Amen. So Father, I pray for these this morning. And I pray for those that will they'll listen to this message. And I just pray, Lord, this is not a message that condemns. It's just one that lets us know, makes us examine ourselves. Make sure that we're hearing your voice. And you will be there to tell us, even when we drive and turn here, turn there, don't go this way. You want to guide us in all truth. For it says, if we trust you with all our heart, and we lean not on our own understanding, and we acknowledge you in all our ways, you will direct our path. And so we want you to direct us to the people that we need to speak to. We want you to tell us what to say. And we want us to just be a total slave to you. Because you're so worthy for us to yield up our lives to. In Jesus' name, amen.